Hi everybody, now we are going to talk about respiratory disorders part two, lower respiratory disorders. Here is a good visual to talk about some of the causes of dyspnea. So infections to the lower respiratory tract. Pneumonia. Uh, there's different classifications. There's community acquired, hospital, healthcare associated, and ventilator associated pneumonia. The findings typically patients, um, especially in our elderly patients, some um, anxiety and fatigue, weakness, um, discomfort due to the excessive amount of coughing, um, confusion from hypoxia, again, in our older clients. Um, so I think one story I told um, about my husband's uncle's father, um, he was found in his home kind of slumped over, very disoriented, um, and that was due to um, confusion from the hypoxia since he had a terrible case of pneumonia. Um, findings, fever chills, flushed face, diaphoresis, which is sweating, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, um, crackles and wheezings and coughing. Um, here's a quick uh, sound bite on what that can sound like. So that's um, an auscultation, what crackles can sound like, uh, particularly in the base of the lungs. Um, you, patient may have a decrease in O2 sats. Um, and remember what I talked about, if you do have a patient with a decrease of O2 sats, um, and the story I kind of talked about is, say you go into a room, you have a patient with pneumonia and their O2 sat is at 89. Um, some things you want to do is do some assessments. Um, one, make sure that the O2 sat probe is securely on their hand. Check to see if their hands are cold, um, nail polish. Um, basically check your equipment first. Make sure that everything is functioning fine. Um, if that all looks good, um, look at your patient. Are they distressed? Um, are they laying flat? Should we elevate the head of the bed some? Um, you know, if there's, as long as there's no contraindications to that get their head of the bed up. Um, if you've done that, next thing, ask your patient, um, you know, to do some deep breathe and, and coughs. Um, and like I talked about, you know, I always tell my patients to, um, you know, smell the roses and blow out the candles. That helps them get a good breath in and um, see if their O2 sat continues to rise. Because sometimes with the amount of coughing that somebody is doing with pneumonia, um, the breathing can get kind of shallow and they're not taking good breaths. Um, so don't run out of the room freaking out that um, a patient's O2 sat has dropped some, um, especially if they're really not showing any signs of distress. Um, you just might have to check on that patient more often to continue to encourage them to breathe. Diagnostics, um, we want to do CBCs just to check if there's any infections going on with increased uh, white blood cell count, um, nursing care, like I mentioned, positioning, encouraging coughing, deep breathing, incentive spirometer. So make sure you know how to use an incentive spirometer because if you don't know, you can't teach a patient. Um, and, you know, encourage nutrition and fluid intake. You're not going to get better if uh, you're not eating, and especially with this fluid intake, which obviously has been a common theme in the upper respiratory disorders is going to be just as important with lower respiratory disorders. Encourage rest and if they're on any medication. Complications, atelectasis, um, sepsis, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Management obviously is going to be based on the cause but antibiotics <coughs> If a patient needs help uh, with breathing, they may be prescribed bronchodilators. Um, albuterol gives rapid relief. 
um, in Pramtropium uh, can decrease pulmonary secretions. Um, theophylline um, does require close monitoring just because there is a narrow therapeutic range. So if you have a patient that's on this, you need to watch for the signs and symptoms of toxicity. Um, so make sure you know what these symptoms are, which is going to be headache, blurred visions, and palpitations. Okay. Um, antibiotics, um, unfortunately, a lot of times patients may be on heavy doses, um, so they're going to put them at risk for frequent stools, yeast infections, um, and to monitor kidneys in older patients taking penicillins and cephalosporins. cephalosporins um, and a lot of times nowadays, uh, especially if patients are on antibiotics, they're encouraged to um, take probiotics alongside of it because basically antibiotics are um, non-discriminating and it just kills all bacteria in the body and that's good bacteria and bad bacteria. Um, but our gut needs good bacteria um, and that's what is causing some of these frequent stools and just kind of clearing the system. So we need to encourage patients to replenish uh, that good bacteria, um, which comes in forms nowadays there's over-the-counter probiotics. Um, probiotics can be found in um, yogurts, um, other products like kefir, um, which is a good source. Um, other management pain, um, especially if they have difficulties coughing, that can help with some of the inflammation. And if they're given prednisone, um, just know your caution with patients who say have diabetes because again, um, steroids can lead to hyperglycemia. Um, one last thing too, albuterol. Um, I would just kind of monitor patients because it can cause tachycardia. Um, if you have a patient who's going to do albuterol, um, you may warn, warn them saying, you know, once you take this, you might feel your heart race a little bit because that can kind of scare a patient if they've never experienced that before. Here's a picture that just kind of goes over uh, pneumonia again. If you are a visual person and likes to see um, can kind of get a mental image in your head here. Tuberculosis. Um, in terms of nursing care, what you need to know um, is symptoms, um, cough, weight loss, anorexia, bloody sputum, low-grade fever, night sweats or chills. Um, those obviously at risk are going to be your healthcare workers, those who go into areas that have a higher incident of TB. The test that you do um, as students is the Mantox test, but it does not confirm an active disease because TB can lie dormant, which is some of the problems with TB. Um, and that's where a chest x-ray can look for active lesions in the lungs. Um, the acid fast bacillus smear and culture, if it is positive, it can indicate an active infection. Um, quantiferin TB gold, um, that can show either an active or latent infection. Um, but at least for what you need to know, um, is your Mantoc test because this is something that you might run into more often um, if you work in a clinic and have to um, administer the test and just kind of know um, what is considered positive. Other thing you need to know, airborne route you need to be fitted for an N95 HEPA respiratory mask. Um, so do not, as a student, go into a room of somebody that has TB because you need to be properly fitted 
uh, for a mask. Um, and there's a process um, of making sure that a mask is properly fitted for you. So it's not simply just putting on the mask and saying, yeah, this feels secure. Um, you have to go through a fit test. Um, Patients need to be transported wearing a mask. You typically, if a patient's being transported, go the shortest route possible. Um, management um, is usually going to be 6 to 12 months. Um, and ATI Chapter 23 uh, goes more um, on page 137 regarding the medication considerations and patient teaching. But some things that are important are, because here again, if it's airborne route, hand hygiene, cough and sneeze hygiene, um, samples have to, sputum samples um, need to be taken every two to four weeks to monitor a therapy. Those with active TB need to wear a mask in public, which is kind of scary. Um, but other thing you need to know outside of a N95 mask, airborne route, patients need to be in a negative pressure isolation room. And this is something that can come up on NCLEX. You need to know negative pressure isolation room. Pleural conditions, pleurisy, uh, it can be a complication of other uh, respiratory disorders, of trauma. Um, physical assessment, though, pain, 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 pain. It feels severe, sharp, and knife-like. It's like stabbing pain. Let's see here. And here is a sound bite if I can get to it. If it wants to behave. Here we go. Or not. If you want, <laughs> listen to that sound bite um, just in the actual PowerPoint. Listen to that to hear what a plural affliction rub sounds like. Um, Management is going to be to treat the pain with NSAIDs, narcotics. Um, sometimes it's so severe that a patient might need a nerve block. Um, then obviously treating the underlying condition. Big thing because pain is worse when a patient takes a deep breath, cough, or sneezing. It's basically taking care of the pain and um, helping a patient into a position that decreases their pain, but also promotes their breathing. Effusion versus emphyema. Effusion is just going to be fluid, where emphyema is going to be pus. Um, you can see the difference. Effusion is usually going to be more of a complication of a respiratory disorder, um, a heart disorder, <coughs> or an infection. Um, or um, different types of cancers. Uh, emphyema or pus is typically going to be more bacterial related, um, abscess, trauma, um, surgery, or thoracentesis. Symptoms kind of depend on the underlying cause. Um, emphyema are typically um, those with uh, who are acutely ill that might have some other inflammatory uh, symptoms. Um, but the big thing that I just want you to know is just kind of the difference. If you see the word effusion, think of collection of fluid. If you hear emphyema, you know that's an accumulation of pus. Um, and that is just a type of pleural effusion. So if you just hear the word effusion, just know that it's some kind of fluid, um, but more specifically, if you hear emphyema, then emphyema, then you know that it is pus. <coughs> um, patients who have either one of these that might have decrease or absent breath sounds, um, again, it makes sense because if they have fluid in the um, pleural space, um, then that's an area where there is no lung tissue because it has been pushed away. Um, you might have a dull flat sound on percussion. 
Um, depending on how severe it is, a patient may be in respiratory distress, um, they get a tracheal deviation away from the affected side, um, hypoxemia of a uh, PSO2 less than 90, a hypertension, or tachycardia. Um, physical examination is typically done, um, and then, of course, uh, thoracentesis um, will actually confirm the presence of fluid, and that's when they're actually taking a needle and drawing the fluid off. Management, underlying condition, drain the fluid. Um, patients typically, once they drain the fluid, they'll have a chest tube placed. Um, they'll need to have pain management during, um, while they're having the fluid drain. <clears throat> they need to splint when they cough, and that just helps with the pain. And obviously, you need to monitor um, any pain medication that you give to patients, especially if they're given narcotics, because sedation happens before respiratory depression. Trauma-related, um, you can have rib fractures, um, clinicals, depending on the type, if it's sternal um, versus a rib fracture. Diagnosis, chest x-ray, um, ECG, O2 monitoring, ABG analysis. Um, most rib fractures will heal on their own in three to six weeks. Um, it's usually going to be about monitoring pain, ice, a chest binder, and that's what this picture is. Avoid excessive activities, um, any associated injuries, and a lot of times surgical fixation is very rare. Pulmonary contusion, this is an injury with a blunt trauma resulting in abnormal accumulation of fluid in the interstitial and intraavillary spaces. Um, if there is a contusion, um, symptoms um, are unfortunately going to be very similar to some other um, lower respiratory disorders, so in terms of what you need to know about it is just understand what a contusion is um, in medical management. Um, with most lower respiratory um, disorders is going to be always about promoting ventilation, pain management, uh, any supplemental O2, and if there is an infection, then treat the underlying infection. Cardiac tamponade, this has kind of uh, made a reappearance again from cardiac. Um, it is the compression of the heart from fluid or blood within the pericardial sac. So again, um, this can be part of a result from a blunt trauma to the chest. Um, that's why it is again here in respiratory. Um, just know these patients, um, it is painful if they're lying flat, so put them in this um, tripod positioning. And the big thing is you want to um, get that fluid off of the heart, and that's done through a pericardial synthesis. So pneumothorax versus a hemothorax, one is air, one is blood. Um, the way to basically treat it is going to be through a chest tube and oxygen. Um, I will have a separate um, short video that gives you a um, short rundown about chest tubes and hopefully kind of makes it simple for you, I hope. Um, so please make sure uh, you take a look at that because um, at least for testing purposes, I um, want you to understand some of the complications with chest tubes. Um, in terms of knowing your masks, um, when a patient does have a chest tube in, um, the difference between a Venturi mask, it gives a mix of room air and a fixed flow of O2, where a non-rebreather, a patient is getting 100% of O2 and um, is, is high flow. Um, so just kind of know the difference between those two. and. Um, 
and you can tell also um, a nasal cannula usually goes just in the nose where you can see these are covering the nose and mouth because if you think about it have you ever had a patient with a nasal cannula and you go in and check on them they might be a mouth breather um, so they're not getting the full benefit of um, the nasal cannula so you have to again be mindful of them to breathe in through their nose and blow out through their mouth or as I said before smell the roses and blow out the candles um, patients that do have pneumothorax in our or a hemothorax um, you want to monitor them every four hours. Um, the ventilation ventilator system, um, if they are, you need to check those settings. Um, position the patient for a maximum ventilation if it is required, which is going to be high fallers. Um, monitor chest tube drainage. And like I said, we'll go a little bit into chest tubes in a separate um, recording. And um, obviously, encourage prompt medical attention if any infection does occur. And again, here we go again, deep breathing to encourage a full lung expansion. Subcutaneous emphysema, um, this again is when um, air might escape into the tissues um, and get underneath the skin. Um, I had mentioned in class that this can happen um, during laparoscopic surgery, um, especially if it goes for a long period of time. It's actually CO2 that will get into the tissue. It does really sound like um, Rice Krispies, um, but other area, areas that it can happen is if a patient does have a chest tube in um, around the area where the insertion of the chest tube, so you'll want to monitor for that as well. Complications, uh, pulmonary embolism, this is basically when a substance uh, can enter the venous circulation and form a blockage in the pulmonary uh, vasculature. The most common is going to be a deep vein thrombus, um, basically that, ex that exists here in the leg and will actually travel up into the lung. Um, prevention is going to be important um, for those who are at risk. Um, smoking sensation, have appropriate weight for um, a person's height and frame, healthy diet, um, preventing DVT specifically by leg exercise, um, compression stockings, and avoid sitting for a long period of time. Um, risk factors, long-term immobility, this can be long car rides, long plane rides, pregnancy, long bone fractures, and advanced age. Um, now, like with long bone fractures, what this can be is like a fat embolus that can break off um, and travel as well. And so if you get a patient that has a fracture, um, the best way to prevent if they come in is to immobilize that fracture. Um, so that's going to be the best way to um, help prevent, say, like a fat embolus from traveling um, from a fracture. Um, expected findings, um, the big one is going to be this feeling of impending doom. They may have pressure in their chest, anxiety, pain upon breathing, tenderness, difficulties breathing, like they're gasping for air, cough, and um, hemo, um, hemostasis lab, CBC, a D-dimer. Um, there will be elevations in response to clot formation. Um, the range for that is 0.43 to 233. Um, but this is kind of important to know as somebody kind of decompensates um, that as there is a um, embolus that they will be in respiratory alkalosis since they are trying to um, rapidly breathe and they're blowing off the CO2. Um, but as they decompensate, it will go from respiratory alkalosis to acidosis and then ultimately metabolic acidosis. Nursing care, O2 therapy, 
high fowlers that helps with ventilation, uh, monitor respiratory cardiac status. Um, patients who actually survive a pulmonary embolism, um, more than likely they're going to be on long-term uh, Coumadin or uh, Warfarin therapy. So educate them about bleeding risks, you know, um, using razors, um, using a shave, like electrical razor over blade razors, um, and education about um, to prevent further thrombus, which I kind of talked about before, in terms of not sitting for long periods of time, um, not smoking, healthy lifestyle, um, management, um, anticoagulants. Anticoagulants uh, do not break up an existing clot. Um, if they do use something, that would be a th thromb thrombolic therapy or the clot blusters like um, at a place, right a place, and tenonect a place. Um, they may have an emolectomy done. Um, the vena cava filter um, will help in the future to help filter out clots. Um, and one type is called a Greenfield filter. Um, and complications obviously is decrease uh, cardiac output and hemorrhage um, with the use of some of these treatments. And there is your visual. Atelectasis, that's a collapse of the alveoli that will lead to a loss of lung volume and it can cause mis mis mismatch of lung ventilation to perfusion which leads to deoxygenated blood supply to tissues. Um, there are different types. Um, your absorptive atelectasis, um, this is when there is surfactant inactivation, <coughs> excuse me, or when there is less than normal levels of inhaled um, nitrogen present in the alveoli. Compressive, um, this can come from pleural effusion or tumors, obstructive. This can be a mechanical obstruction of the airway, whether that's from secretions, tumor, or a foreign body. Those who are going to be at risk, and this is um, what you would need to know, is those post-op, um, those with chronic lung disease, like COPD, uh, morbid obesity, tobacco use, um, any surgeries that last more than four hours, um, prior CVA, lung cancer, pleural fusions, or NG2 placement. Presentations, difficulty breathing, cough, um, leukocytosis, sputum, sputum production and fever, you can hear crackles, um, of smaller affected areas versus larger affected areas. In terms of what you need to know for testing, again, is knowing what atelectasis is, what it leads to because of that mismatch of deoxygen blood supply to tissues, which is not helpful to the body, um, not getting oxygenated blood, and know those who are at risk. Chest tumors and cancer. Um, big thing you need to know about um, cancer in terms of lung cancer is risk factors. Um, so just because somebody smoked doesn't mean they're ultimately going to get lung cancer. Um, but make sure that you do know how to calculate PAC history. So here are some calculations, one pack for 10 years, half pack for 20 years, or two pack for 10 years, and one pack for five years, and here are your answers. Um, these last couple slides is just kind of more of an FYI, but that obviously um, the type of work that a patient, or type of work that a patient can do can lead them um, to having occupational lung disease and this obviously are going to be those who are exposed to different types of agents that actually get into the lungs and form legion, legions in the lungs, um, destroy the alveoli or clog the alveoli and the bronchioli.
So the types are going to be from silica, asbestos, to uh, coal, coal dust. Um, smoking can compound the problem, so obviously a smoking sensation is important, and unfortunately this is not reversible, so management is going to be supportive. So that's about it. Um, like I said, just make sure you check out uh, the short video about chest tube management, and uh, that's a wrap.